Welcome, everyone. My name is Lindsay Elton with Eco Achievers, and, and I'm joined by my colleague and, and partner, Graham Giovanoli. We are the, the presenters for tonight's meetup. So, um, so again, tonight, um, thank you again so much for joining. We have a, a wonderful group in attendance tonight. It's great to see y'all. I, I hope you come back. <laughs> um, and and I would definitely recommend during this conversation, this is, yes, this is a presentation, but this is a conversation. Um, we're all we're all colleagues and professionals and and some friends and and we're in this in this together. So if you have any questions, you know, please either I, I think we're going to to hold off on the Q and A until the end. But um, any questions that you may have, this is this is the time, and and we are happy to go into detail and to share, you know, the the good, the bad, and the ugly, and 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 really uh, be here to to make this as beneficial as possible. As this slide shows, we will earn or you'll earn one FIA CEU for tonight's presentation, and um, and if you were at the the Passive House Conference this this year. Um, I I apologize. You might be seeing duplicate information because this is pretty much uh, a, a lot of the content that we covered then. But we got some great feedback um, about it, and it's relevant. You know, for this conversation is relevant as we're all um, starting new projects and or getting into second and third projects. So thank you for joining us and. And without that, I will get started. Um, but thank you, thank you again. Um, my name is is Lindsay Elton and Graham Giovanoli. Um, we are experienced credentials, green building verifiers, and it has been wonderful to have been a part of the passive house movement for quite some time now, with a lot of firsts in in the passive house world with multifamily projects and mm -hmm. commercial projects. And some single family projects. So um, so before we get started, just just a quick understanding and if and if you could just share this in the chat, what you're most interested in are is it single family, multifamily, commercial, all of the above? And just to get a sense of of some of the conversation, perhaps, and Jennifer, maybe you can. Let us know. I see 24, 25 responses. So thank you for responding. Looks like mostly single family, but a lot of everything. Okay. Great. A lot of all of the above. A lot of all the above. I like yeah, that. Yeah, all are pretty represented between single family, multifamily, and commercial. <laughs> yeah. And cool. Okay, so pop quiz surprise. You haven't learned anything yet, but we're going to get into it. When is a, a woofy model required um, for all FIAS 2021 projects, only multifamily and commercial? It depends. Or wait, woofy, what happened to PHPP? And if you aren't aware of PP, PHPP, that was the old modeling software prior to Woofy. So, and I can see some, some responses coming in. So the Woofy model is required um, pretty much in, in all passive house projects minus the core prescriptive single family program. So that is when you will get, you, you will be able to have um, some choice on, on the path if you want to uh, go with some of the more stringent, stringent specific measures or, or go the performance path, which we'll talk a little bit later about. Um, another requirement, when is the CPHB, the Certified Passive House Builder or Certified Passive House Consultant, CPHC required? Um, got some of the same line in, 2021 projects, multifamily, depends. Wait, what happened, PHPP? And as you're as you're thinking about this, I, I I do need to to check some sources. So the certified passive house builder 
is not a requirement, which it would be wonderful actually, you know, just uh, to take this small moment to have that because our, our builders need the support. And having this training is super, super helpful to have them get an understanding prior to, to starting on a project. Because just like you, if this is one of your first projects or you know, second or third project, you realize that, that this is the first or maybe second or third project for, for a builder. So the, the training, there, there aren't as many Passive House projects around. So ha- giving them some of that insight uh, has been really valuable. And it, I can say it definitely helps when, when project teams uh, do have a CPHB um, on board. So for the CPHC, and this was one that that I needed to talk to, like maybe, or, or if anyone from FIAS is here, our understanding was that CPHCs and and also, you know, with the with the single family core path or the prescriptive path, that CPHC is not required on on all projects. Um, it is a recommendation, but it is actually not a requirement. And then to the last question, when is a rater verifier required? And if we haven't set you up enough on that, um, the rater verifier is required on on all projects. So you cannot um, get a project certified without having a rater. And in the difference between the rater and the verifier is the rater works on single family homes while uh, the verifier works on multifamily or commercial homes. So, all right. Now that we kind of have an understanding of, of some of the roles, let's let's get into the design. When we start, when we start our projects, the raters, we as the raters often, you know, I think that there's a variety of times that we come into the project, but I would um and, and we would definitely recommend bringing us on board as soon as possible. And and the reason why is because. There are so many different design considerations that you need to account for in addition to just the, you know, and I don't want want to minimize it, but your woofy model um, or the whole building blurred or test, there are so many other aspects of it um, to consider. So having everyone at the table early on is, is vital. And it's the same thing with FIAS compliant construction. You know, what uh, are, are we thinking through those details so that these features are constructible? Some of the design considerations that, that we talk about are, are your construction details buildable? Looking through uh, window details and, um, and, you know, like being able to trace your air barrier, that that red line test all the way around, um, making sure that the designs that you are creating and and sending over are are actually constructible. How testable is your HVAC design? During the passive house verification process, we are we're going to be doing multiple tests for HVAC, both from the rater side as well as during testing and balancing. So talking through and making sure that we've got accessible systems, there are access panels, um, we, we can reach the air handler, we can reach intakes and, and, and duct work properly so that we can do all of the verification that is necessary. How compatible is your HVAC design with FIAS TAP requirements? This is kind of, I would say a big one, having, um, having separate um, or dedicated ventilation ductwork versus separate space conditioning ductwork. FIAS does not directly prohibit you from combining the ventilation and the space conditioning um, ductwork, but the way that they have the verification set up, it makes it really, really difficult, specifically in um, non-commercial projects, so single family home or multifamily uh, units, makes it very difficult to be able to supply the correct amount of continuous ventilation 
and space conditioning at, at you know, different CFMs and uh, at, at different times. So, so that's, that is, that is a big one. Um, and we can talk about it more afterwards, but that, that I would say is, is definitely one that, that causes challenges and, um, and, and has caused problems during final verification. Another one, have you thought through sequencing for mid-construction testing and verification? The testing and verification that, that we do in that, um, that your raters and verifiers might do, it, they are not required by FIAS, but they are extremely, extremely helpful to allow you to gauge how efficient you are um, or how efficient your um, your air sealing has been, how efficient your duct sealing has been. Have you missed, you know, key areas of the air barrier, like um, around transition areas? So you're like your foundation to your wall. There's a, a, some valuable, valuable information that that we can assess when we do the mid construction testing and allowing the radar to be there prior to drywall, prior to insulation, uh, can, can be, you know, um, just allowing that time, um, for, for the radar verifier to come in can be extremely helpful and worthwhile for your project. And then mock-ups, like having, having a mock-up, being able to test something out, um, having a mock-up done early, we've seen um, different types of mock-ups, whether that be just a standalone outside so that um, the trades know like what the building assembly should look like, or we do a mock-up, like a test on a window. Um, you'll see a photo later on for one of our mid-construction um, slides that shows one of the tests that we do for for windows to see um, if if they have been flashed correctly, if they have been sealed correctly. Um, so all of those pre-tests are small, I would say small, you know, helpful gifts for you along the way to to give you support as you're on your way. Um, I'd also support. like to add that it's on larger like, projects, don't underestimate the value of, of like a building envelope commissioning specialist. We see that work really well in combination with a rater because the rater can't always be there or doesn't necessarily have some of the tools that you know, building envelope commissioning specialist uh, consulting firm would have like um, uh, material air leakage, the, the bubble tester, they'll do air and water tests on the windows. Um, and then, you know, a series of uh, mock-up testing like Lindsay's talking about. So working in conjunction with them and, and the Raider on larger projects could be an asset. Um, and, and kind of a final note on this, within the design considerations, um, we know that, that specifically as the project is getting started um, and, and you're working with your CPHC um, and in your building your woofy model, there are various features you know that that are are a part of the woofy model and the FIAS workbook that are are um, independent and um, and solely for for FIAS. But depending on the certification path, there are other design considerations that you need to be aware of. So, so this timing is really important to bring your verifier or your rater on as, again, as early as possible so that you know about these other certification requirements that aren't included um, when you're building your Woofy model, which is kind of the reason behind more than a blower door because you know, we have been a part of projects that that teams have thought that the only items for certification were the blower door testing and the woofy model. And there's, I think as, as we all know, there's just so much more. Okay, so um, so getting into it, FIAS single family homes. And this is um, this is a project from, from one of our Chicago local FIAS rock stars, uh, Tom Bassett Dilly. This is Acorn Glade. And um, I can't remember if if this one was on on the tour this year or not, but um, it it was a, a great project that their team and and that we worked on as well. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the the paths for single family we've got two choices. We've got the prescriptive path, 
which is the core or the performance path. And the prescriptive path, as the name suggests, <clears throat> has all of these various requirements for compactness, um, for um, maximum window to wall ratio, for um, skylights. It has a tighter blower door threshold. There are um, moisture risk and, and condensation factors that you have to account for. So there's this, this workbook checklist. And so this is just a screenshot of, of what that looks like. Um, but the, I would say one of the benefits of the prescriptive path is that you do not need to do the WUFI modeling. Um, however, you do need to certify in Energy Star Zero Energy Ready Homes in Indoor Air Plus. So energy modeling from the radar side is still required. You just don't have to do the woofy modeling. And, and part of that trade-off comes with, like we see, the tighter blower door thresholds um, is 0.04 per CFM per square foot of enclosure, whereas the performance threshold, we have 0.06. Um, a couple other items, um, renewable electric generation power systems are, are, are not required the electric vehicle readiness is required. And yeah, I think um, just it's it's something to get used to. Um, we have found that it's really helpful, even though a CPHC wouldn't be required or a, a, someone with experience on a passive house isn't required, that, um, that they're very helpful. So we often recommend if you're taking the prescriptive path, to consult with a CPHC to help you with some of these design considerations to help talk through, you know, as you're as you're making your choices, as you're doing the, the design, have them consult with you on on, you know, things to consider and stay ahead of that you might not know um, if you didn't have the experience. And then the performance path, and I'll I'll hand it over to Graham right now, is what we what we might think of as some of the previous passive house projects. So that's going to be our woofy modeling, all of the certification, um, the various certifications, and and all the testing. And Graham, I will let you take it away. Thank you. Um, so the vast majority of our projects are per the performance path, um, whether they be single family multifamily or commercial. So we'll just walk through each of those right now. Depending on what area of the country you're in, uh, would be a different Energy Star for Homes uh, version. Right now in Illinois, we're 3.1, but other places might still be at three or even more advanced over in the Northwest. So uh, single family homes and townhomes, the DOE program that's the basis, it's now split into single family homes and multifamily new construction, which we'll talk about in a second. Like we said, it's performance-based compliance, so modeling is required. There's going to be unit-based modeling if you're going the EIR path, um, which you would for, for home, or rather, there'll be HERS modeling and then there'll be WUFI modeling as well. So they'll be required. Uh, it's all pass or fail, so there's no optional credit. Everything is, is prescriptive, primarily designed for new construction. And then there's a series of checklists uh, that most of us might be familiar with. There's the HVAC design report, which the mechanical engineer or designer uh, is going to uh, fill out. And, um, and then we're going to cross-reference and check. There's also the HVAC commissioning checklist, which is for the HVAC professional, the, the installing director. Um, and then our uh, checklist, like our Raider, our Energy Star Raider checklist, would then um, verify uh, a lot of those items on the commissioning uh, checklist. Uh, and then there's the Builder Water Management Checklist, which is kind of the sole responsibility of the builder. We do kind of spot check all of those items as they relate to other checklist items, and then just as a, as a safety net, if you will. Uh, and then I referenced it before with the Energy Star Raider checklist, which is our responsibility. There are a couple items, you know, a limited number of items that can be signed off by the builder, um, but it's our responsibility to look at mechanical ventilation, insulation, grade one, 
uh, air seal, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, mandatory certification for project teams uh, is the for the builder, there's energy Star builder partnership, so they can sign up. And then for the rater, there's the Energy Star certified rater, which you know, you're a HERS rater, and then you're an Energy Star rater, and then you're a FIAS rater verifier. And then for the HVAC contractor, depending on the mechanical system, they would need to be HQUIDO or HQUIDO certified. So those are the certifications that are required for single family townhomes. And and Graham brings brings up a good point. If um, if you or or any of your colleagues are interested in becoming a rater or a verifier, um, we are in high high need, <laughs> um, high high demand. Specifically, I would say probably in the East Coast and in growing more as passive house is is is. Um, becoming um, more prevalent for like LIHTC or affordable housing projects. Um, so if you're interested in becoming a, a verifier, you know, these are some of the steps that you have to take. Becoming a ResNet Rater, taking specifically the, the Energy Star um, certifications and the, and the multifamily certification. So depending on if you're working on single family or multifamily projects. So those are some of the steps steps to take if you're interested. Thanks, Lizzie. So let's move to multifamily. Uh, so uh, like I mentioned before, we've kind of transitioned over to multifamily new construction, and it's a blend of the old single family uh, program and then the old multifamily high rise programs. And now it's referred to as the Energy Star multifamily new construction. Um, inspections and testing for units and the common area now. There are different compliance options. So you can go the prescriptive path, the ARI path, or the ASHRAE path. Um, and then there are, you know, a little bit different requirements for each of those. There's core requirements, you know, for all of them, but, you know, a little different for each one. One uh, notable insulation requirement is there's continuous insulation that's required for buildings that are four stories and over. Uh, central exhaust ducts that serve four or more units um, very soon will need to be tested. Uh, you have the option of testing them now, but that it will be mandatory very soon. There are requirements for garage HVAC. Expanded HVAC design report now includes common area calculations. So there's uh, a little bit more compre comprehensive calculations on the, the uh, HVAC uh, the mechanical designer side, excuse me. And then HVAC functional testing uh, needs to be required by a credential third party um, for depending on the mechanical system. So if you have a project with mechanical systems that uh, you could go the greater uh, route. They are capable of doing some of those duties, um, but as the mechanical system gets more complicated, then a uh, HVAC functional testing agent needs to be uh, on board. And then there's specific orientation trainings for builders and, and modelers. And just to add on to the functional testing, that that is different from um, the tab work that FIAS requires. So for these projects, you're going to have have to follow both the functional testing checklist, which is really, it's kind of like HVAC light or HVAC com commissioning light. They have, they've put together and, and instead of um, if you've done projects with HVAC commissioning, like for a lead project and you've got a BOD and an OPR and um, you've got a commissioning plan and everything, Energy Star has kind of boiled all of that out and has created their startup checklist for, as Graham mentioned, specific types of systems. So you'll do that in conjunction or you will have, you know, your functional testing agent, which can be um, a commissioning agent. It can be a, a licensed engineer. Um, there's, there's a slew of different credentials that that functional testing agent can have. But they're going to be do that in conjunction with the tab work um, that FIAS requires. And also just one quick note um, for the HVAC design report. This is, I would say this is 
quite uh, quite a document to fill out <laughs> is is the feedback that we've gotten from engineers um, because it it has to be filled out by by the engineer and the, or the designer of the system. Um, this is critical for us for our pre-build submittal. Um, with the certification, we submit it to our another QA body outside of FIAS, and that HVAC design report is a critical piece. So for any of the teams or if there are any engineers on, on the project, having that that done for your rater you know, soon and in design uh, is, is important so that um, we can get our, our pre-build um, confirmation done. Great. And, uh, <clears throat> So some notable requirements to consider during uh, design in either single family or multifamily insulation values are gonna, uh, you're gonna refer to the reference table depending on um, you know, whether it's floor, ceiling, or walls. There's requirements for reduced thermal bridging in single family specifically for material efficient framing. You may be looking at advanced framing, ventilation design, for FIAS, we want to make sure well, we're on Energy Star right now, but um, the ventilation design requirements for Energy Star are slightly different than for uh, passive house, passive house being a little bit more dialed in and stringent. So paying attention to those differences. Uh, window values, again, you're going to go to reference tables. We have to look at the commercial uh, or common space as well as the residential portion and multifamily buildings. Uh, so, you know, keeping that in mind. Lighting, fish, lighting efficiencies and controls are slightly different for Energy Star than they are for Zero Energy Ready, uh, which we'll get to in just a second. And then local exhaust uh, for kitchens and bathrooms are going, uh, are, are, you need to, excuse me, you need to pay attention to. Um, so kind of layering on all of the different certifications and looking at uh, the most stringent requirement and, uh, and then going from there is going to be uh, advised. And then appliance and plumbing fixture selection is also something to keep in mind. And depending on the path, Graham mentioned the ERI path, the ASHRAE path, or the prescriptive path, those will, within each of these sections, so this is essentially what the multifamily Raider Field checklist covers. Um, within each section, um, there are oftentimes specific category requirements. So if you go the ASHRAE path, which is the whole building modeling or the ERI path, which is the unit modeling, you'll have some different requirements within Energy Star to pay attention to. Okay, so one of the other certifications that is required for FIAS is Indoor Air Plus. Uh, it uh, is built on or the basis of is a requirement for Energy Star certification. So that's requirement number one. Um, there are similar credits that are seen in the Energy Star Builder Water Management Checklist, so there's some overlap there. Uh, you can have Raider or Builder sign off, just like the uh, Raider Field Checklist in Energy Star. Um, and then there's material bedding, low VOCs for materials, so composite wood products, paints and finishes, and then carpet adhesives and cushion. We oftentimes uh, put this on the builders, designers, to make sure that all of the specs meet these requirements. So we'll do our check in the rest of the the rest of the categories, but then ask them for material vetting on their side, on the design side. Uh, and then version two is coming very soon. We're just kind of coming to the end of Indoor Air Plus version one. Zero Energy Ready is only seven items instead of 4,210 in, in Energy Star. So that's very nice. So the, the action here in Zero Energy Ready is typically on the water side or water efficiency. So there are seven categories uh, to keep in mind um, and to check the boxes for. So first one being the Energy Star for home space line. We want to make sure that it's certified under Energy Star in the applicable jurisdiction in the country. Uh, envelope fenestration needs to exceed Energy Star again and then uh, needs to meet or exceed the 2015 IACC levels. So in our plan review during design, we look for these things and check them off, make sure that all the boxes are checked and requirements are being met. Requirements for the duct system, 
So uh, unlike Energy Star, ducts need no, duct systems need to be located entirely within the thermal and air boundary. That's notable. And then HVAC air handler uh, needs to be the same in the thermal and, and air barrier boundary. Uh, like I said, for water efficiency, depending on whether it's unitized or central, there's going to be hot water delivery uh, distribution requirements. So you might be using the um, the volumetric and design tool uh, that's available, or you could go the prescriptive route of water heaters and fixtures meeting uh, the efficiency criteria. We usually see the latter, the prescriptive and unitized systems, whereas the central systems, um, we would see more of the kind of performance path, if you will, the, the first option, distribution and central. Uh, there are a uh, little bit more stringent requirements for lighting and appliances. They, those need to be paid attention to. So uh, refrigerators, dishwashers, clothes washers, all need to be Energy Star qualified, whereas in Energy Star, they don't necessarily need to be. And 80% uh, of lighting fixtures need to be Energy Star. Indoor air quality, you need to meet Indoor Air Plus, and then uh, renewable ready. So, um, you know, you need to install the appropriate infrastructure for uh, renewables to be installed, either at the completion of projects or at some time in the future. And a lot of this pairs nicely with the 2021 program and electrification readiness and some of, um, you know, the, the needs to meet the woofy thresholds and some of your load calculations, obviously, or some, some correct to meet some of your load limits, um, that solar may need to be installed. If it doesn't need to be installed, as Graham mentioned, we've got this PV ready checklist. Um, so for multifamily projects, um, it's, it's slightly different. The requirements are different. Uh, in that it only needs to, we only need to account for the common spaces, um, whereas in for a single family home, uh, it would obviously be for the entire home. So, um, so just work through with your rater what, what those specific details are. And then this one, just like Indoor Air Plus, there's going to be a new version coming out soon specifically with with multifamily projects, uh, there, there's going to be a zero energy ready home multifamily program. Currently, the zero energy ready home program is capped at five stories, and we have to go, we have to do the ERI path in order to comply with zero energy ready homes. Why that's why that's important in, in just a side note for this is with the new Inflation Reduction Act, they paired or they adopted. Energy Star and Zero Energy Ready Homes for compliance with the Inflation Reduction Act. So depending on if it's a single family home, um, you can get $2,500 for Energy Star or $5,000 for Zero Energy Ready Homes. And then if you have a multifamily building, um, depending on prevailing wage, you could get either $500 a unit or $2,500 a unit for Energy Star $1,000 a unit or $5,000 a unit for zero energy ready homes. But just keep in mind that it that we need to use that ERI path. And with that next version of the program, I think we'll see that, um, that we're not, um, hopefully not going to have to worry about um, the limit, the, the story limit or the path that we need to take. Great, which brings us to the FIAS workbook, which is largely our domain, um, but it's uh, essentially comprised of an amalgamation of all of the other checklists. There's certain points where there's additional requirements or slightly uh, more stringent requirements than the checklist, but mostly it's the requirements of all the checklists put together into a convenient place here. We won't go into all the details of the workbook, but it, it deals with all aspects of the project, both uh, during mid-construction and then at final um, and design items to check those. I want to make sure we save enough time for some questions. So this is a this is a great slide. There's lots to talk about here, but I'm just going to uh, hit on you know just the surface level. We do a lot of hands-on 
site visit time uh, and uh, an interaction with, with the building team. Uh, we come out for slab insulation, both uh, perimeter and under slab, and then it starts to, and then we like to see air seal details when, you know, some critical junctions like where the foundation wall meets the wall, where the wall meets the roof, and then your opening, so doors and windows and penetration. So when those things happen, we like to at least be there or see an example so we can make sure that, um, you know, we're giving the best advice possible. We come out for framing. Uh, where we look at, again, air seal details and a lot of the, all of the rough measures for Energy Star uh, and the other checklists. We come out for what we feel is one of the most important uh, site visits, which is the uh, mid-construction lower door test. Um, we have a slide devoted to that. Uh, we are doing a uh, mock-up unit lower door test. The requirements for compartmentalized lower door testing are a little less stringent, actually a lot less stringent, um, than the whole building lower door test for a passive house. But on the first available unit, we'll do a, a big construction lower door test there. And then we do duct tightness testing to give valuable feedback because if the ducts are not tight, then tab is really hard to do and it's very hard to get CFM to the places where the designer intended it to go. Uh, and then we come out for final construction. There, we're going to do the whole building blower door test and compartmentalized uh, testing. Uh, typically, we'll do sampling in a multifamily building, uh, but you could do every unit if you wanted to. And then uh, single family, obviously, there's only one, one building, one structure, so you do you know, a whole building uh, test. Uh, there's domestic hot water distribution efficiency testing, so uh, you know, 10, 10 uh, degree uh, under a 10 degree rise in a certain amount of water or volume. Uh, we look at the ERV wattage. Uh, we do ventilation and supply and exhaust testing. We shadow tab if it's a larger project or if it's single family, we'll, you know, we'll do it ourselves after tab has done it. Uh, testing and balancing is completed. Space conditioning supply, we're gonna test the supply uh, values uh, or flow. We take a ton of pictures of everything uh, just to make sure we get the refrigerator in the right light. Uh, and mechanical appliances and lighting. I can't hear anybody laugh because we move on mute, but I know you are. Uh, mechanical appliances and lighting, we're going to grab all the tags and uh, specs and make sure that what was designed, it was actually installed. So we'll true up our models, essentially, our, our, our energy models. Uh, tab verification is very important, testing and, and, uh, and balancing. So the rater or verifier uh, really should be in contact with the tab contractors ahead of time because the requirements for commercial tab are different than they are for the very um, specific range of FIAS. You know, with FIAS, we need to be within 5 or 10 CFM of the target at times. Um, and a commercial tab contractor might be familiar with being within you know 25 CFM of the 25 CFM of the target or even 50. Also, the the equipment that's used could is is often different. Um, low flow bolometers and ventilation testing equipment versus large commercial equipment. Um, we need to give contractors the guidelines early so they know what to expect. And then we'll want to be there. We we are there uh, when tab work is being done to confirm that the process runs smoothly. Usually we show up on the last day to kind of shadow um, because we're allowed to do that via via um, to confirm that the flows are meeting the requirements. Uh, so trade support. This is really really important. Just like Lindsay said. Uh, you know, it could be their first project, it could be your first project, but we need to give them the resources and the tools uh, available. There are lots of them that we can track down and provide to set them up for success. So being there at those critical times for air seal, giving them, you know, a lot of the manufacturers and material providers have spec sheets and best practice installation of their product, providing those. Uh, things to them can be really valuable and really useful. 
I think one one of the things is just to to realize that you know they're the ones that are constructing <laughs> this building. So you, we can have all of the details, but if if they're not supported and and they don't know, you know, the expectations, then it's not going to happen. Um, okay. And then our last uh, our last slide is is kind of like our our top ten uh, just reminders to schedule us in really uh, it, it is helpful to get us in in the right sequencing so that we can do some of the mid-construction tests. And efficient domestic hot water design, is, as Graham mentioned, is part of Zero Energy Ready Homes. Um, that one of the tests that we do, um, it just uh, it, following the requirements and just being aware of those specific details. Um, and it can be tricky depending on, on what your design is. Um, that that combined space conditioning and ventilation, like we we highly highly uh, recommend not doing it at least right now. Um, and if not, we need to work through with Fias um, and and just be very aware uh, with your mechanical designer what what the verification requirements are. Um, our tab process mockups and and just a reminder that you know Fias certification is. Um, you know, anything in a building like your body, what happens in one area will affect another. So, um, so all of us need to be on the same page and, and really uh, understanding how important everybody's role or role is your, your drywaller is as important as, you know, as your insulators, your mechanical, like everybody plays an important role. And I think that is it. So, I can leave this up or take this down um, and and give everybody the floor for any questions. Jennifer, would you like me to keep this up? Seems fine, unless sure. there's a slide you need to go back to. Sure. There's a couple of questions in the chat. I'm not sure if we answered all of them. I see one question that says zero energy, uh, zero energy ready homes requires ERI path for Energy Star. Um, no, uh, you can take the uh, you can take the ASHRAE or uh, prescriptive path as well. You're, you're not beholden to the. Not not for zero energy ready homes. You have to take the ERI path. Okay. Forgive me. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You're not able to do it yet. They maybe perhaps in the next version, but this current version of it, um, you would have to take the ERI path. A question from Teal uh, about what are some of your most memorable inspections or FIAS verification moments? Um, that's a good question. Uh, and I'm thinking about this on the last slide. Uh, you know, we said please don't combine ventilation with. Uh, your heating cooling system because it you know it makes it really difficult for us to uh, uh, to verify um, and, and I just wanted to expound on that a, a little bit which is the reason it's so hard is because your ventilation flow is going to be a lot different than your heating flow which is going to be different than your cooling flow so how do you uh, design for all of that in one system uh, and we just I remember coming to the realization on a single family project a little bit ago and going, how in the world are we supposed to do this? It, it doesn't, uh, you can't do three things in one. Um, so that was one kind of moment I remember just off the top of my head. Um, I, I remember one to speaking to the tab process um, and in the low flow um, rates that specifically like bedrooms will need. We had a commercial contractor on um, a project and he walked off the site uh, because he got too frustrated with us needing to be within five CFM. <laughs> um, so so I, I think that that goes to that specific comment of just relaying what, what the requirements are. Um, these folks are professionals. They've been around for a long time, um, but these requirements are are different. So we just need to make sure that they know what they are, so that they can do it right. Yeah. 
Um, another interesting moment was doing a blower door test uh, on, on a local school and it was raining. Um, and <laughs> um, <laughs> that that shortened the day and made it extremely, extremely difficult when we're trying to, to depressurize. So like your scheduling for your visits. Pressure. Yeah, uh, I remember that thing. We didn't stop because <laughs> you, you don't have a tarp over your, your entryway doors. You're going to pull all of that moisture directly into your fan. And that might be the end of your fan. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was pretty memorable. <laughs> Yeah, and and Mike, I saw your comment about the car regulators. Um, yeah, they they do work. I will say that they are they are not one hundred percent foolproof. Um, when when doing some of the tab testing, there are ones that um, that have not worked. So um, as long as they're working properly, <laughs> um, they are they're great. We agree. Um, there's a there's a question about can you elaborate on the correct process to utilize a guarded unit when testing multiple townhouse units? Um, what what should we look for to see if this is working? Um, we saw noticeable air infiltration on a job today, which didn't seem like an accurate test. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, guarded testing can be used. Um, well, there's pressure neutralization testing, which is sometimes synonymous with um, with, with guarded testing. Um, but ultimately, with guarded testing, you're depressurizing all of the spaces around the unit itself. Um, for, for air to move, you need a pressure difference and a hole. So if the pressure difference is the same, then you're only going to be measuring across the holes, which is going to be that exterior wall now, because now between the unit and the outside is the only place where there's a pressure difference. So in a multifamily building, you might be just pressurizing the entire building, and then at the same time, the unit. Uh, in townhomes, you would be doing that. You would have to put a lower door in each unit because they're not connected, and then you would only be uh, measuring the leakage across the surfaces to the outside. I don't know if that helps. Um, I don't really understand the question uh, to be able to sound a little further. I can elaborate on that a little bit. Um, so it, it wasn't testing of a single townhouse unit. It was they actually had a holes cut in the party wall between between say you know three townhouse units, and and I, I think the tester just didn't have enough fans to test the entire building. So they were going to test two to three, you know, uh, town, townhouse units. And that fourth unit was uh, supposed to be pr pressurized to, uh, to to equal out to the to the tested units. But but when standing next to that party wall that was supposed to be equalized, there, there was a lot of air coming through, you know, multiple gaps. It, so to me, it didn't seem like an accurate test. Yeah, there I would say, um, you know, you'll want to make sure that if you have pressure points, uh, uh, or pinch points rather. So, you know, you need to be within, it technically says you need to be within five pascals of, the, of your uh, tested measurements. So if you're testing at 50 pascals, you'll want to put a manometer in one unit and throw it into the next unit to make sure that that pressure is, is the same. And then you'll want to keep doing that in each um, zone to make sure that you're maintaining a 50 pascal pressure difference. So that may have been one of the issues. I don't know. Well, I felt the process to, to, to figure out how to equalize the pressure between units was, was unscientific. I mean, it was literally, literally somebody standing ne next to the party wall, you know, verifying that they could feel air coming through or not, you know, while they're on the phone with the, uh, the other guy on, on the other fan. So um, it, it didn't seem very scientific and it, and it didn't give me any confidence in the test. Okay. Um, well, there's the add a hole method that could have been utilized there. Yeah, I mean, you know, ultimately we use blower door testing uh, for two reasons at that point. One is to identify leakage specifically by, you know, via smoke, thermal imaging, or tactile. And then two, the, the hard number, which is how close you are to the target. 
Um, so, you know, those are some of the tools that we use to identify, uh, you know, leakage and how to button it up. But yeah, science is, uh, science is our friend there. And I just wanted to follow up on, on Greta's question. Um, so, so the Zero Energy Ready Homes program currently is only, you can only certify that through that program projects up to five stories and, and they have a hard stop at five stories. So if you had like a garage on the first floor and then, you know, maybe just a little bit of common space um, and, and then four stories or like five stories above it, but only four floors of, um, uh, of residential, like they would still, or, or if you had like four floors of residential and two floors of garage, they're still considering that six store, six stories, and they would not, um, allow it to, to comply. So they've got a hard five story stop. Um, and you do have to use the ERI path uh, because they they currently do not um, allow you to do the ASHRAE path or the prescriptive path. Um, but with FIAS, if you have a project that is six or seven stories, you still have to comply with zero energy ready homes. You just wouldn't certify in it. Okay, and that the H2O calculator, um, that used to be on the on the FIAS website. Um, <clears throat> I after after it's changed and and rebranded, it, I, I I'm assuming it's still there. Um, however, I haven't looked for it in a long while. And that and that helps. Those are the calculations, um, and and so um, based on the the diameter of of the piping and and length, you can calculate the amount of uh, water storage um, uh, in the pipes. Okay. Um, I would say if anyone has any other questions, feel free to verbalize them. Um, we're we're a few minutes over, so I think we could probably do one one last one. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, if, if you do have any questions, please feel free to, um, to ask them uh, on the meetup or, or let us know. We're always happy to, to help and support, um, and, and we hope this was beneficial for you. So um, just a reminder, too, for the self-report code for the, for the CEU, it's 23910. So you'll have to um, go on the FIAS portal and, uh, and, and add that on. Um, and we hope to see you next time, um, the March 15th, I believe it is, for the Row House discussion. Yep. So all right, everyone. Have a great night. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.